president of Hong Kong New Business School and director of Asia Global Institute. The panel comprises the Honorable Bernard Charwood Chan, Vice Chairman of the Board, West Kowloon Culture District Authority. Ms. Jane Chan, Head of Start Me Up Hong Kong, Invest Hong Kong, and Mr. Paul Liu, Chief Operating Officer, Lala Move. Let's have a group photo together first. Thank you. Please take your seat on stage. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to uh, the Hong Kong U Business School uh, Thought Leadership uh, Conference Series. Uh, I'm the moderator, Hei Wai Tang. Um, you know, the first session was wonderful. Uh, I thought by studying Hong Kong for the last few years, I already uh, know most of the uh, situation in Hong Kong and you know what are the uh, potential challenges and also opportunities then after listening to the last half an hour discussion I had some uh, new thinking uh, but today my role is a moderator so I'm not going to summarize anything that I just learned but I thought they set up a good stage for us to think about the solutions and try to think about uh, the visions that have been proposed uh, by uh, Larry and by Chris and others. Uh, so, uh, this session uh, has the title, uh, let me pull up uh, the booklet. Uh, I have been moderating at least uh, 20 sessions in the last three months. Uh, it's called Exploring New Frontiers, Uncovering Economic Opportunities for Hong Kong's Transformation. So first of all, I think uh, most of us here agree that you know, the Hong Kong economy needs to be reinvented. Uh, we all know that uh, you know, the economy has not been doing great. Uh, since 2020, for obvious reasons, the uh, stock market has not been doing great. Uh, and, you know, there have been concerns about uh, the Hong Kong government budget. So all these problems have to be fixed, uh, and the question is how. Um, today we have a set of distinguished uh, panelists uh, who really need no introduction, and I'm not going to waste time to introduce them carefully. Uh, you can see the bio in your booklet. Uh, to my left-hand side is Bernard Chen. Uh, who obviously is a very important figure in Hong Kong, chairman and president of the uh, publicly listed company called Asia Financial Holdings. Uh, he's also currently a chairperson of Hong Kong Council of Social Service, as well as a steward of Hong Kong Jockey Club. Uh, but most, most importantly, uh, you know, the reason why I invited him to come here uh, is because uh, he's the chairman of Amplus Museum, and we're going to talk about art and culture. Um, and formerly, uh, he was the uh, convener uh, of the non-official members of the Executive Council of the Hong Kong government. Uh, he's also a proud graduate of Pomona College in California. Uh, uh, right next to, he, uh, to him is Jane Chen, uh, who is head of Startup Hong Kong at Invest Hong Kong, uh, and she has been uh, working in the uh, startup ecosystem for many years. Uh, and, you know, the reason why uh, we invited her to come here is to talk about the startup space in Hong Kong and the entire sort of innovation ecosystem in Hong Kong. And last but not least, uh, to the far left of me is uh, Paul Lu, uh, who is the COO of a very successful tech company in Hong Kong called Lala Move. Uh, and previously, uh, he has worked at Cathay Pacific for two decades. Uh, so I guess you know, we should not ask him anything about Cathay Pacific uh, uh, today, uh, but we should focus on Lala Move and what uh, Lala Move has been doing. 
so the plan for this panel is each of them is going to give around a five minute speech or introduction remarks. Uh, and then we're going to have uh, a round of discussions and eventually I will open up the floor and I'll guarantee there will be at least three questions from the floor uh, in order to outcompete my, my boss, uh, Professor Tai. All right, uh, how about we start with Bernard uh, to talk about um, your expectation of Hong Kong. How do you think Hong Kong can be reinvented, especially in terms of uh, you know, the art space or the cultural scene? Thank you, Hei Wei. Uh, to start with, um, since I've been invited to speak in my arts and culture capacity, so I thought it's important, uh, I only got five minutes. There's a lot to cover in five minutes. Uh, um, now I'm sure by now, everyone in Hong Kong are convinced that arts and culture is real. I mean, for many, many years or decades, I think most of us, when we first, when the whole first Kowloon was first introduced, I think everyone just assumed that, oh, come on, we're not real about arts and culture. This is another property development, you know? This guy's under the arts and uh, culture. Even I believe that for a long, long time, until now, right? Because finally, you can see it. But just let me remind everyone in the room, because I'm pretty sure none of you, maybe one or two of you only, actually remember how we got started. I mean, you see it today, right? You, see, you mentioned Ampla, the palace, and so on, but do you remember how this all started? Anyone here? Uh, maybe Patrick, Patrick in the administration, he may, he, oh, no, sorry, not this Patrick, that Patrick. <laughs> so he may know, because he's in the administration, but he might not actually know the whole story, because I didn't. I actually had to went back and dig back and see who actually started this idea. And it went, so I only got three minutes left now, so I'm going to use that three minutes just to remind everyone the journey that got us here. This is now the most amazing timing, right? It's the arts and culture is the comeback story for Hong Kong. It is the only reason people are coming back here now, right? Because it's something new. Now, but how did we start it? It started 25 years ago. Mr. Tong started it. Well, I'm pretty sure it wasn't his idea, but at least it was in his second policy address in 1998. In this policy address, there's one paragraph that talks about, it didn't even say West Kowloon Culture District. It only talks about that we should have additional art and culture venue in this reclaimed land. Now, also to remind everyone, where does that reclaimed land come from? Anyone? I know it's not supposed, to be a not supposed to be a dialogue, but I just want to remind everyone. How did that all start? It's not even 98. It went back to the late 80s when the colonial government announced the grand plan of moving the airport to Lantau. So part of that whole entire core airport program, which included infrastructures, so it talks about the airport, the highway, the train, the bridges, and the Western Tunnel. The entire thing at that time, when it was first announced, was 140 something billion Hong Kong dollars, right? 140 plus billion dollars. And when, was, when that was first announced, the Chinese government responded, who's gonna pay for it? Are you gonna suck up all our reserve and leave Hong Kong, right? That was a big controversy at the time. Who's gonna pay for it? Ah, the answer to that, the only one solution for Hong Kong, as always, is property. Right? So the entire strip of land at the time was part of the um, reclamation uh, for the tunnel. But no, I was told at the time that it was always intended to sell off that land, right? To pay for all those infrastructure, part of the, 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 to pay for part of the cost of the infrastructure. So from where day one, that has always been designated for property development. But then by 98, so apparently I was told later on, confirmed by him, Gordon Steele was the one who suggested to Mr. Chong that, hey, you know, this, this is a prime land right by the harbor. We should not just auction off for the highest bidder to build another you know, property, commercial or residential. We should have something arts and culture. Because apparently Gordon, those of you who know Gordon, he's, he's, a, he's a, very passionate about music and so on. 
So it was included there. It wasn't that, well, he, obviously he managed to convince the tone to include that. But there was no actual plan. Well, that's 98. Then what did we do next? We spent the next 10 years doing what Hong Kong people do best. You know what that is? We argue. It took us 10 years to figure out what actually we want to do about it. It's only until 2008 that we established the West Kowloon Cultural District Authority. It was 2008, or 10 years. Now, of course, there's a lot of ups and downs in between. You know, remember the canopy design? There was a big controversy about canopy design, but that's not here for to discuss that. But I just want to remind everyone, it, it was a long journey. It took us 25 years to get to where we are today. But today, I am so happy to tell you, this is the best thing happened to Hong Kong. It's a huge investment. If you want to know the number, I'll tell you how much we already spent. We spent billions of dollars, US dollars already. But it's no turning back. Now, I, I can answer more later on, but this is the, this is, I guess I said, repeat it again, this is the comeback story for Hong Kong. Right, to, to, uh, and we, you, we have lots of time to, uh, for further exchanges of why I firmly believe this is the case. Thank you, Bernard. Uh, I did prepare a lot of questions for Bernard later, so I'm going to ask whatever you have in mind. Uh, don't worry, you know, I will give Bernard a chance to talk about why um, M Plus, Palace Museum, and the entire West Kowloon is going to be a very important part uh, for Hong Kong to be reinventing reinvented. Uh, but I want to turn to Jane uh, first uh, to talk about what's going on in Invest Hong Kong and also the startup space uh, in Hong Kong. And I pre uh, remember you have some slides uh, that you want to show. I do. And um, can I just say first, it's a, a real honor to be here. And thank you so much for the invitation to be speaking at some. I represent Invest Hong Kong, which is a government department responsible for inward FDI um, into the city. What that translates into is that we are responsible for helping overseas companies to actually establish here, you know, across all different sectors, you know, whether we're talking about financial services and banks and institutions, to the little restaurants that are coming over from Japan and, you know, the mainland, to all the other sectors of Hong Kong's economy, um, you know, that is, is incredibly vibrant. It requires a lot of inward investment. And, you know, our department has been working on actually attracting those type of companies and supporting them in their setup here in Hong Kong. Um, I head up specifically the Start Meet Hong Kong sector, which is um, Invest Hong Kong startup division focused on supporting startups um, as, as well as the, the other kind of stakeholders within the startup ecosystem to establish in the city. So that obviously includes the startups themselves, but it also includes the lights of the investors. It also includes the, you know, the accelerators, the innovation units, and all these other really important stakeholders that are required to build a successful startup ecosystem. Um, I just want to just set the stage because sometimes I hear the word startup being used quite interchangeably, you know, for new businesses. For us, when we talk about startups, we're talking about um, a scalable company with innovation, sometimes within a technology or other times within the business model itself. So when I'm referring to startups, we are talking about those type of, you know, highly um, scalable, um, usually externally funded kind of companies. So I just want to spend just a, a few minutes just to give you a little bit of background about what the Hong Kong startup ecosystem is. And then, um, you know, it helps us to set the stage for, you know, the discussion on the transformation and the transition of Hong Kong from more uh, a traditional kind of financial services um, as well as like a you know, traditional industries to something that's more focused towards the, the knowledge economy that everyone has been talking about in the last panel and towards that innovation and technology. So if you don't mind, can I jump to the next slide, please? So Invest Hong Kong has been um, actually tracking development of the startup ecosystem for the past eight or nine years. And the reason we do this is, um, is twofold. It's basically to try and get a snapshot of exactly what's happening in our startup ecosystem at any given time so we can actually get the relevant kind of policies in place or inform our policy-making departments you know, whether we're talking about ITIB, whether we're talking about CEDB and all these other kind of acronyms for the different departments 
departments to actually formulate um, supportive kind of environments for startups. But in addition to that, we need to look at what Hong Kong stands for in terms of innovation and technology compared to other locations. If you don't have a baseline of what's happening in your startup ecosystem, it's very hard to actually, um, you know, focus on what your strengths are or maybe look at areas you need to do more. And here you've got the, the results of our startup survey. That was the, the newest results that we just released um, last November, last December actually. So just over the, the past few years, a number of startups residing at the various co-work spaces, accelerators and incubators um, have just hit about you know 4,200. The number of people actually employed in this sector has also been growing to about, um, you know, uh, the kind of um, 115,000 kind of people. But the one thing I think um, people are not aware of is that Hong Kong startup ecosystem is incredibly international. One in three founders, if you take into account you know, the returnees of, of like about 7% Hong Kong returnees, one in three founders come from outside of Hong Kong. And you'll see in the bottom there the makeup, the countries of origin for those founders. So, of course, naturally, uh, mainland China, our mainland, is, is um, you know the biggest kind of uh, you know basically uh, territory of origin for a lot of the founders here in Hong Kong. But we also have a lot of participation from you know from the UK, from the United States, France. Um, Australia and um, usually Singapore is up there as well for this last year it's sort of moved slightly further down but Singaporeans are also usually there within the top kind of um, top five as well. Um, if we want to understand a little bit more about the kind of sectors that these startups are, are working in, um, Evan go to the next slide please. You see that um, oh, oh sorry <laughs> I didn't realise, oh, thank you so much for <laughs> um, technology hey um, you know, uh, naturally, the, the biggest kind of sector for Hong Kong and the startup ecosystem is in that fintech sector. Um, you know, I say naturally because Hong Kong is one of the world's financial centers. We've got about 320,000 people employed in that kind of sector. So, you know, there are a lot of different kind of solutions that has been there. But you'll see some of the other top areas reflect a little bit about the economy as well. The fact that Hong Kong has always had this history of trading for the past, you know, 30, 40 years, it's reflected in the fact that our second biggest group is actually on the e-commerce and logistics side as well. So there's a lot of logistics tech and e-commerce kind of operations happening here. The ICT side is more targeted towards um, the, the kind of uh, the conglomerates as well as the, the businesses we have here. So these are the business to business kind of platforms and solutions that are selling these, um, you know, whether we're talking about, uh, you know, software that helps to uh, manage uh, human resources, for example, all these different kind of things, it's also reflected. And education tech was actually a sector that has just really jumped up over the past few years. And again, that was probably a reflection of what we've been seeing with COVID. Um, you know, a lot of people uh, focusing on online education. So I won't go into too much detail here, but I just wanted to give everyone just a, a quick understanding about what's happening here. And, um, you know, we can jump into you know, more details later. Thank you. Thank you, Jane. Um, so I'm going to come back to you to talk about, you know, what are the potential unicorns uh, after we hear uh, from Paul, uh, who is running a unicorn, uh, Lala Move, uh, and share with us some of the secrets, how a Hong Kong-born company to become so globally well-known and so successful. Thank you, Harry. Um, what I'm going to do is take the next um, uh, few minutes uh, talk about um, our company as an example because uh, we are talking about future of Hong Kong and um, well, what's the opportunity for companies in Hong Kong. So uh, I'll try to uh, share with you uh, the stage we are in, the journey we have been through uh, as a typical new generation Hong Kong company. Um, what are the opportunities and what are the uh, challenges that we faced and how we try to resolve it. So uh, we, we were a unicorn that was uh, quite a long time ago. So we are a grown-up unicorn. And remember, we are the orange one, not the other color. And uh, you would have seen our uh, vehicles, our driver partners in Hong Kong a lot. Actually, we run two brands. Uh, the brand that we use to uh, do our business in mainland China is called Huolala. So if you have gone around China, uh, we are in more than 300 cities all around the entire China with the biggest presence in uh, southern China. So 
We have been in Greater Bay Area long before we start to talk about Greater Bay Area. Um, and then outside of mainland market, uh, we use the brand uh, Lala Move, and uh, we are at the moment the world biggest closed loop tech enabled logistic platform. So to give you an idea of the scale, uh, these are published figures, so I can talk about the figures in the first half of uh, last year. Uh, on a monthly basis, we have more than a million driver active partners and then more than 12 million uh, active users on a monthly basis. That's roughly the scale uh, we are in. So the essence for a tech company uh, scale is super, super important. I may come back to this uh, word scale a uh, number of times. And then um, we started back in 2013, so just 10 years. And 10 years is a long time for tech startup, but very short time for uh, major companies. And we have grew from Hong Kong and then went to uh, mainland China and Thailand in the second year. Um, so we thought about uh, market beyond Hong Kong uh, since the very beginning. And it was very natural for us to uh, expand uh, in our motherland as well as the nearby market, which was called Southeast Asia in the past, uh, ASEAN, and then uh, Bell and Road. We, at the moment, cover all the major cities along the uh, Bell and Road uh, markets. Um, so, and uh, last year, well, now is uh, the year before last, uh, we also started uh, Blankadesh, uh, that's South Asia, part of Bell and Road. And the other two markets that we are pretty big, physically not along Bell and Road, but uh, conceptually, they are part of it, is uh, LATAM. We are in Brazil and Mexico. Uh, we cover 17, 17 cities in Brazil, which is our uh, second biggest market outside of uh, mainland. So you can see that um, uh, expand internationally has always been our DNA, and it's super important for us to uh, go beyond our comfort zone, uh, look for market that can give us scales, and look for opportunities that we can apply our global playbook. The other, the, the, before this page, the other lessons is uh, many of this market has been uh, money losing for a number of years, which is quite typical for tech startup. Um, but uh, last year, for example, we turned long time market like uh, Thailand, Vietnam, or Indonesia uh, into uh, being profitable. So any company, even though they're a tech startup, eventually they have to make some money. They can't just keep losing huge amount of money forever. But at the same time, for uh, founders, especially new startup in Hong Kong, you need to be patient. You can't do things, everything overnight. And sometimes it takes a few years for you to build up your market presence, for you to understand your market uh, to be successful. So it did take us some time to be profitable in many of our major markets. So next page, briefly talk about what exactly do we do. Uh, we, we actually is the platform that enable link up uh, users and driver partners. So the drivers, not our employee, we don't uh, own the vehicle, but they participate in our platform. As a result, they see a lot of orders from our users. Users could be individuals, could be uh, SME, which is a big bulk of our users, could be enterprise. And we link them up together, uh, tag in between, um, optimize the matching, so that uh, the driver partners with the least run can take up their next orders, and users can have a truck in 10 seconds with the uh, uh, size and f uh, fulfill their need. And that's uh, also helped to reduce uh, carbon emissions because uh, that minimizes any empty run. And the lessons in this is, as we grow our business, it's more than just um, scaling up. It's just important to manage our stakeholders. In our case, we have a huge users community and uh, security for them, uh, convenient to use, uh, custom experience, very important. And our driver partners, they stay with us as we grow is because we look after um, their uh, interests. Uh, by working with us, we present uh, extra earning opportunity at a very flexible way for them to uh, choose to work and improve their income. And at the same time, that helps uh, our other stakeholders like regulators, government. And uh, during COVID, for example, in many of our market, unemployment showed up and many people who lost their job temporary, they joined the platform, managed to earn some income to keep the family going. And at the same time, being the logistic 
last mile, uh, we have the network almost like the uh, blood tube for uh, different societies and help deliver a lot of the uh, medical supply to people that they, they need help. So stakeholders, um, even though as startup you may not think about from day one, eventually you have to deal with it. So uh, what I'm trying to say is uh, we have been having a uh, challenging and interesting journey, but we have been keeping our global understanding of our business, uh, apply the same business model, the same set of tech, but with a very local approach. Everywhere we go, we have a very local team. Every single uh, local market leaders, they come from the local market. We speak to our local users and driver in a very local way. So even though you might be a company coming from Hong Kong, when you expand to uh, other market, you got to speak in their language and be able to adapt to the local market situations. So if we can do it, so will be other art companies in Hong Kong. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. It's wonderful uh, to see uh, a Hong Kong-born company uh, going global uh, and using all our advantages in Hong Kong in terms of hiring international talents uh, to continue to make Hong Kong to be relevant and to be a hub uh, in your particular sector. Uh, but I want to go into a 10 to 15 minute uh, interactions on the stage. Uh, and I want to first ask a question to Jane, uh, lady first, sorry, Bernard. Uh, and I want to ask Jane this particular question, maybe a bit broad, but I just want to see how uh, you see Hong Kong uh, can be potentially an innovation hub, maybe with Shenzhen, uh, through your capacity as um, you know, the head of uh, startup uh, in Invest Hong Kong. Because you know, I, I see the numbers that you showed um, earlier, uh, you know, we have like hundreds of uh, fintech startups, hundreds of e-commerce startups. All these are startups, right? And you know, for Hong Kong to be a really uh, innovative city, uh, we need maybe like 20 Lala moves or some of the fintechs really become competitors with our traditional banks. Our economy is still heavily dependent on the traditional sectors, right? To be fair and to be honest, right? Banks, finance, real estate, professional service. Uh, so are we still talking about a very initial stage of the potential development into innovation center? And can you give us some confidence that you know, some of these companies can be leaders uh, in transforming our economy? Sure. Um, I think you know, when you mention the traditional industries that Hong Kong is still very reliant on, you know, we're talking about the, the financial services, the professional services, um, you know, real estate, all actually all these industries We've been very lucky to actually have that, this trading hub that we've had, this background, because all of it is actually massively beneficial to the development of, of innovation and technology. You know, we've got these traditional industries and we've got these entrepreneurs who can basically, you know, look at the, the, the business opportunities in terms of those different kind of sectors and come up with very innovative kind of solutions um, to actually address those. So I actually see that as a massive kind of benefit. Um, but you're right, we are are, you know, transitioning um, to an economy uh, that will incorporate a lot more of the innovation and technology side, and that's not something that only Hong Kong is involved in. You know, we've got cities around the world who, you know, understand the potential impact that um, highly scalable, innovative kind of companies, the kind of impact they can make to an economy. You know, you know, we, we hear about Silicon Valley a lot, but there's also a lot of different hubs around the world, you know, that are really very much focused on that. So I actually think in Hong Kong, we've got some, you know, really good kind of like potential opportunities there. But if you look at, you know, the development of innovation and technology, when did it start? You know, I think we, we can basically, you know, push it back to the past, actually, two decades. Um, Innovation and Technology Commission was actually initially um, set up in 1999 to actually come up with strategies and policies to actually steer the development of innovation and technology forward for Hong Kong. We also had the, the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park established in 2002. We had Cyberport, another science park, you know, Hong Kong's major um, te technology and science park established in 2004. And I think, you know, collectively with these different kind of developments happening, it started that process of people looking at potentially technology or innovative kind of 
business models that we can potentially um, develop into a very substantial kind of um, a company. So if you look at that side, historically, that's been what's happening. But in terms of actually real momentum behind the push, I think innovation and technology and anyone in the startup ecosystem will probably... Um, you know, tell you the same thing. And of course, Paul has been in it from the start and, and, you know, they've been around for about nine years or so. I think, you know, we've really been seeing a lot of the developments happening probably within the seven to eight years. Um, certainly, there's been a lot of government kind of um, support in a number of different areas. Financially, for example, the financial secretary in November in one of his speeches said that 200 billion um, Hong Kong dollars have been put into the development of innovation and technology for the past few years. I mean, some of that is actually going into infrastructure, um, you know, just building out new buildings, for example, at Science, uh, Science Park. There's been new kind of programs, promotional um, areas, you know, um, people development, all these kind of things. So there's been, uh, you know, quite a big push, concerted push by the government to try and support that with, you know, certainly on the financing side, but also in other areas where, um, you know, we, we need to, to and develop policies to try and steer that along as well. And, you know, we, we can certainly talk a, a little bit more about that later. But I just wanted to, to talk about the startup ecosystem. How do you actually build a successful startup hub? You need to have certain fundamentals in place before that can happen. You need to fundamentals, access to market, access to funding, access to talent. Without these three really basic things, um, you, 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 know, you, you can't even have the, the development of a, of a hub. And then you've got to have all the other side of things you know, that really help to push it forward. So your um, university is incredibly important and arguably you know, um, Silicon Valley was, was very much built on the premise of, of universities there and really making an impact with industry collaboration that is still hugely important here in Hong Kong, that industry and university collaboration leading to commercialised results and commercialisation is, is a very key word here as well. I think that's, that's what we need to look at. We also need to have the serial entrepreneurs, so the likes of you know, the, the Lala movie guys, for example, you know, once they make an exit or, you know, once they have, um, you know, more kind of funding, they start mentoring other companies, they start investing in other companies. That mentorship and that serial entrepreneurship is also a, a massive driver in terms of taking a startup hub forward as well. You know, you've got to have like a um, real market participation as well. So private sector, incredibly important. If no one's actually buying those kind of technologies and solutions, you know, how are our companies, our startups going to be, um, you know, moving forward? And, um, you know, so, so we, we've got these kind of things in place. When we're talking about access to market, we're talking about Hong Kong Limited, admittedly. But if you're actually, you know, targeting the SMEs and the corporates, we've got a decent kind of like testing market here. But we've got the, the GBA on our doorstep. And, and, you know, Christoph mentioned earlier about, you know, the, the, what he sees through... Uh, the opportunities for Hong Kong as that link through the GBA. There's 87 million people there, so there's market, but also the wider Ars, um, Asia market as well. Then the funding, you know, Hong Kong has got the gamut of early stage angel investors right through to the public market. So that's also kind of helpful as well. So you need these kind of things in place, but you also need the fantastic entrepreneurs to actually come up with these solutions in the first place. And I think Hong Kong traditionally has had that DNA of entrepreneurship through the decades. And, um, you know, I think we're going to see some really strong solutions there. It's all exciting news. Um, I have a follow-up question for you about um, the markets. Um, and that is, well, Hong Kong is obviously very small, and you talk about GBA. Uh, and these days, due to geopolitics, there have been a lot of new focus about our global partners in ASEAN, in the Middle East. So for some of these startups to really grow and scale up and become like Lala Move and you know, maybe even bigger, uh, what do you think would be our strategic markets for Hong Kong companies? or you know, there's no one single strategic market and we should really think broadly about you know, how Hong Kong can radiate out from, from a very small city. 
Uh, I think, um, you know, startups by definition have always looked um, across borders. I think, you know, investors uh, tend to invest in startups when there's that opportunity to scale um, across the globe. As to where the strategic markets are, it really does depend on the type of companies we are talking about. Now, Hong Kong, you know, relatively nascent ecosystem of maybe about seven to eight years, um, you know, a, a, a small population of 7.4 million people. We've managed to create about 15 unicorns over that time. Um, you know, some of them are, have, have gone public, some of them left Hong Kong, but we, we had um, the creation, we had about 15 companies being born here that have scaled and made a big impact. And, um, you know, I, I think the most obvious market at this moment in time, obviously, is the one that's closest to our doorstep, which is the GPA um, and, you know, the rest of uh, mainland China as well. It's, it's such a, a big market. It's not an easy market. Um, and, you know, it's very, very tough. Even regional differences and, and the way things work, as, as we know, if you're working in tech, you know, there's almost two versions of everything, one for, for um, mainland China, one for the rest of the world almost. But, you know, companies are adapting their technologies. Lalamu is an excellent kind of example in that. So we're seeing a lot of that. But I think um, Southeast Asia, Asia is actually a, a, a kind of even a, a bigger kind of focus for the majority of startups that we see um, coming um, internationally um, to Hong Kong. Uh, they, they see like uh, the different kind of opportunities in, in Asia when, when we're talking about, you know, the, you know, whether they're catering to the, the consumers, in which case, you know, they will go to the more populous countries um, like Thailand, like Indonesia, like Vietnam, or whether they're looking more or for, um, you know, the B2B that hits like a certain kind of industries and green tech, for example, then we're seeing them more in areas like uh, in Thailand, for example, where, you know, there's quite a, a lot of momentum on, on, you know, adoption of, of green technologies. So I think, um, you know, that, that strategic market obviously is to take advantage of our geographical location, which is in the center of Asia. But by definition, um, startups will scale everywhere. Kluk, another travel tech um, unicorn, for example, um, they, they, you know, they are a company focused on... Um, you know, providing and selling uh, travel services and activities on a platform. They are, you know, they basically made uh, 3 billion US dollars in revenue last year. And they've got 1,700 people on the, their payroll um, across the world as well. So, you know, it, it does vary. And I think, um, you know, that where companies um, can really understand different kind of markets and leverage the kind of strategic um, advantages that we've got here, I think we, we're, we're you know, poised to see more growth in the, those number of startups, I mean, um, unicorns. Great. Thank you, Jane. Um, so I remember our keynote speaker, Joseph Stiglitz, said um, sort of the technological space are going to be divided into three different groups of standards. Um, and obviously, these are risks, but also opportunities. Uh, but in the area of art and culture, uh, I think, and you know, Bernard can correct me if I'm wrong, the geopolitical tension should be not severe. And therefore, I do see out of the eight regional or international centers that were sort of, I would say, imposed uh, by Beijing, uh, for Hong Kong to become uh, an international art and cultural center should be relatively easier and also extremely important uh, in this very uh, difficult geopolitical environment. So I just want to ask Bernard uh, to comment on, you know, some crazy things I just said, right? You know, how can you see Hong Kong to be an international and cultural center and why to be that is going to help us to become more vibrant and more resilient? Well, to start with, um, you can weaponize anything these days, including us and culture. In fact, that's the only reason why I am the chairman of the board. <laughs> Uh, but you are right, relatively, I mean, we're, we're not stealing anyone's technology, right? So that's, that's a good start. Uh, but yeah, but we need to find that common ground. We, I am very sure in my remaining lifetime, you will continue to see um, polarization, right, in every front. So we will continue to have to find space where we can agree to disagree, and arts and culture is one. You're right, but it doesn't mean that it's, uh, it's, you know, it's risk-free. It's absolutely not risk-free. 
So, but anyway, let me, but me, I just want to comment on something else uh, about, uh, we, we mentioned about the ecosystem, right? So I want to talk about the Austin culture ecosystem. But to start with, I just want to remind everyone in this room that Austin culture is not about just Austin culture, right? The, more, the most talk about topic nowadays, everywhere you go, especially in a business setting, is what? The most talk about things in Hong Kong, every occasion you go, one topic was somehow always brought up. You know what that is? Talent. Talent retention. Right? Can we retain our talents here in this town? Or can we attract new talents to town? Well, after COVID, the way I look at it, you don't need to stay in one city to work. You can travel Monday through Friday. Well, thank goodness we are restriction-free now. Everyone can travel even. Uh, in and out, just like what you used to be, right? You can work anywhere. But the question is, if you are telling some overseas coming, right? Or even talents in Hong Kong, where are you gonna put your family, right? Where are you gonna put your family? You can travel all, 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 all week. Where you base your family is the single more, most important decision. Well then, of course, the, the first thing you need to consider is, well, is this place safe? Right? Number one consideration, anywhere you go, is it safe? Then if you have family, you have family members, school, education, are they good school? Well, then it's not just about education. The next thing about what about quality of life, lifestyle? Well, then you will consider, well, what about culture, right? It's exactly the same thing how New York and London is never just a financial center. You don't go to New York and London just because they're a financial center, because they have the best opera, they have this, the best of this and that. Central Park, High Park, a place where the family, they, can, they want to bring up the family in that city. So for Hong Kong to remain competitive, we need to have the whole package. You know, just now everything I just said, they're all part and parcel of this whole uh, competitiveness of Hong Kong, and we can. Right? We can do that. In fact, no other cities in this region come close to this. But we should not be complacent. In fact, we're only starting this journey. We only start on the arts and culture side. What I mentioned earlier is just about the public sector. What about the private sector? And that's important too. For a true ecosystem to be built, you need public and private. And you look at the private side. Now, just in case you are not aware, Two out of three largest auction houses have now based their headquarters in Asia, in Hong Kong, right? One of them just recently, uh, well not recently, last year, set up their headquarters in Asia. I asked the chairman, I knew the answer, but I have to ask him. So why do you decide to come to Hong Kong? Well, this is last year, when we're still like this. He said, well, it's very simple. It's the money, right? Money talk. We are now the second largest trading of contemporary art in the world. <laughs> Is it the seven million Hong Kong people? Of course not. If we are building all this hardware in Hong Kong just for our 7.4 million people, it doesn't add up. We're not doing this just for Hong Kong. It's not even just a GBA. It's beyond that. We have now 400 million rising middle class in China. 400 million. 190 million ASEAN. The purchasing powers, right? And art, and, and art is no longer just an appreciation. It's an alternative investment. So it's no brainer. That, that space is really happening, right? So of course, uh, we're still a long way to go because we have the hardware. We still need to build the software and software meaning people. But today, it's amazing. I mean, we, the new generation today, they don't want just to do, uh, sorry, they don't want to go to banking business, well, consultancy business only. Many of them, actually, because I, I, in fact, even this morning, I had breakfast with a, a, a coming graduate, and he, she wants to come back to Hong Kong in the arts and culture space, right? We have hope, right? We need to build that software. We got to nurture the talents. Today, we import the talents which is also important. We want the best of the world to come here, but we also need to nurture our own. 
But that whole system, the whole ecosystem is coming, it's actually happening. Again, if you asked me 10 years ago, I would never believe that this would ever happen in Hong Kong because we never pay attention to it. Sometimes it takes a crisis. Now, if we didn't have COVID, if the mess that we're in the last four years didn't happen to Hong Kong, I would t definitely tell you uh, that you might not you might invite me to this room today because where would us and culture fit into technology and finance and everything, right? We're, we're low in priorities, right? To be honest, right? We're low in the priorities. Today, we are the feature together with finance and technology and everything. Every major forum that we are hosting in Hong Kong today is happening in West Kowloon. We are a part of that. If we didn't have those shut, you know, that, that restrictions, cut off, bad press, do you think ASEAN culture would deserve that kind of recognition? No. So in any way, in a way, we are actually somewhat a blessing. <laughs> so people are paying attention. And we are as important as the core pillars of Hong Kong. Thank you, Bernard. Well, regardless of uh, what happened to Hong Kong, we would still love to have you on the stage. Just that uh, we'll ask you to talk about something else because you have so many roles uh, in, in a society. Uh, but I, I like your comment, right? You know, it takes a crisis for us to change. And, you know, we did go through some, you know, pretty severe crisis. And now uh, a lot of Hong Kong people finally realize, well, you know, we need to be different. We need to be diversified. We need to reinvent the city. Um, and also like your comment that, you know, we should see art and culture as an ecosystem rather than just, you know, some pictures hang on the wall in a museum. And talent uh, is going to be the focus of this afternoon session. I hope you can stay. Uh, and listen to some of the discussions. Uh, I know time is running out, uh, and some of you probably feel hungry already, but I should still give some time to Paul to talk about uh, unicorns, uh, you know, how to turn a startup into a scaled up, uh, successful global company. Uh, Jane was talking about, well, you know, doing business in China is challenging, uh, and they have a different set of rules and ecosystem. And I know in China, you don't even call yourself la la mu, right? It's a ho, ha, ho la la. Uh, so my question, which is different from what I sent to you over WeChat uh, yesterday, uh, is uh, how do you manage these sort of institutional, cultural differences across countries? Uh, as a company in Hong Kong, what is your advantage, your meaning your company's advantage to overcome some of these problems? Well, <clears throat> before answering the question, I just want to echo what uh, Jane and uh, Bernard said. Um, it is very fortunate that uh, Hong Kong has a very good uh, tech ecosystem. And there has been a lot of investment, a lot of um, help coming from the government. And the general uh, ecosystem is also very friendly. Uh, just like our office in Hong Kong, we have more than 25 nationalities uh, working in the same office. Uh, it is very important to uh, attract talent in our sectors. Uh, but when we go out, uh, our diverse um, uh, talent pool also help. Uh, many of them understand the situation in their home market. Uh, many of us uh, have been working in an international company, uh, traveling around and do understand the differences uh, across different markets. But in our case, especially in an uh, internet-related uh, business, uh, scale is super important. So while we recognize the differences, uh, we always go out with the same business model and the same set of tech, because that can be the only way to make sure that our business is scalable. And for startup, um, or even before you become unicorn, uh, having a great idea, having a great product is just the beginning. It shouldn't be the end. Even when you grow into a unicorn, eventually being listed, it should just be one of the many milestones. That's not the end. And that's the things that uh, we want to make sure all the new entrepreneurs they, they do understand. It's a very long and could be a lonely journey. But along the way, you need to start to build your team. And uh, you need to prepare for um, uh, when you go to other market or when you face bigger challenge uh, in terms of compliance, in terms of uh, talent attractions, uh, in terms of business development. Um, the team that is core uh, to the startup may not be the, the same team that is core when you're expanding overseas. And you need to continue to adjust your business model, making sure uh, it is a, a solid business model. Um, why, why we know ours is a business, solid business model? Because of COVID, actually. Um, the demand and supply situation changed totally, completely different during COVID. And you can have market. Uh, we are hugely benefit from COVID, 
or everything stopped because of COVID. But throughout that, we know uh, we are here for value, both the supply and demand side, treasure the um, tech and service that we provide. And after COVID, when things are coming back, uh, business are recovering, uh, we see that the growth even faster. So we know that our business model is uh, very solid and can go through good and bad times. So coming back, uh, what, what are the core elements of formulas? I think one thing, you have to have a solid business model, uh, have a global view, being able to adapt locally, and at the same time, do need talents. You need to continue to uh, attract and also build. Um, in our case, over the last couple of years, uh, when markets are opening up, things are recovering, uh, we start to have a uh, few market leaders got uh, uh, hunted by the other competitors or other industry uh, in Southeast Asia, for example. But we always manage to promote from within. So I'm very uh, happy to see that now we start to um, uh, build and uh, promote our own leaders. Uh, that will be a very important point to make sure our, con our continued success as being sustainable. Great. Thank you, Paul. Um, I have less than two minutes left, and, and I blame uh, Professor Chai for overrunning his session so badly. Uh, so I can only have one question from the floor. Uh, anyone uh, who may have a question for Bernard, Jane, or Paul? You guys are like my under, undergrad students, uh, very quiet. And probably, you know, they did uh, their job very well and everyone uh, were truly informed and become knowledgeable. Uh, so let me just close the session by asking each of them 30 seconds uh, to s shout out your wish for Hong Kong. What do you want Hong Kong to be like in 10 years? Uh, maybe st starting with well, Renard. I think um, clearly the future of Hong Kong is how we can continuously add value to the motherland. Hong Kongs have always been serving that role for China in different times. Now, of course, we, what we've done best in the past is probably become irrelevant today, but we just have to reinvent ourselves. So, but the next generation needs to know that. The next generation needs to first understand. We kept calling ourselves a super connector, right? Well, the way I understand the word connector, it means you know both places so that you know how to connect them. But do we actually know them? So I hope the next ger generation would f really make an attempt to really truly understand the East and the West. You don't have to agree to the East or West, but you need to understand in order to serve our role as a connector. And that is the future of Hong Kong. So I would really hope much that uh, they do not give up, but they have to uh, take a step forward and really understand, you know, just stay in Hong Kong and call ourselves a connector is way not good enough. Thank you, Bernard. Jen? My view is um, very much focused on the, the social equality side, actually. I would love to see in 10 years' time that, um, you know, the Gini coefficient, which is the, you know, the disparity between the, the high echelons of earners versus the, the ones at the bottom is actually, you know, substantially reduced. I think education and potential innovation technology can be a leveler and a contributor to that, and I would love to see something positive in that regard. Thank you, Jane. Paul, you're the last. Um, <clears throat> I would like to say 10 years from now, when we look back to the challenge we are facing now, uh, could be blessing because of the tough time uh, new ideas um, could be stimulated, new companies, new startups coming up. Established company, as a result of the tough, tough, tough time, finally put the acts together to transform and um, so that we can take advantage of the um, um, mainland market that we have and at the same time being able to uh, connect to the world. Uh, just like the way we are doing, if we can do it, so will be the others. Thank you so much. I have no time to conclude, but I just want to say that you know, the practitioner's views are very useful for us to rethink about what the academics have said in the first session. I think both sessions interact uh, and uh, you know, synergize uh, very well for us to think about the roadmap for Hong Kong. Thank you. Uh, I hope uh, you all got something uh, new, uh, and we look forward to the keynote speech given by Vincent Lowe.